Okay. Well, we go through a short review from last time. Those of you who wish may open your Bibles or your Bible apps to 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to be starting in verse 35. Probably won't get to 41, but uh, we'll get as far as we can. So last week, uh, we, Paul was finishing his com confrontation of the doubt of the resurrection from the believers. And so basically, his first argument was, if there is no resurrection, why baptize for the dead? And we wrestled with why, what Paul meant by that. He didn't explain himself, so this was likely um, something that was familiar to the Corinthian believers. He didn't condemn the practice, so it wasn't uh, heretical practice. The early church Greek fathers probably had the right idea that the dead bodies that Paul referred to were these bodies that we walk around in, clank, 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 as we get older and older, as God's grace gives us more and more time. And so basically, if we don't believe that our bodies will be raised from the dead, then why go through the baptism ritual at all? And as, as we all know, baptism is based on Christ's death and resurrection. And when the, when the pastor dunks us under the water, we identify with Christ's death. And when he brings us back up out of the water, we identify with Christ's resurrection. And without the resurrection, salvation is incomplete. And if Jesus had never intended to rise again, then why did he go to Calvary in the first place? And then Paul moved on to some of the questions of, if we don't believe in the resurrection, why do we risk our lives for the gospel? And why do we put up with the constant danger if we don't believe in the resurrection? And then he basically, he said, he said that he died every day. And that's the core phrase. It comes first in the Greek, but in the English, it's always in the last position. But the middle part of the verse is, is the most important. And that has to do with the Corinthian believers. Despite their faults and, and the issues he had to confront, he took great pride in them by Christ. And which means that the Corinthian believers were actually a testament to his faith in the resurrection because he wouldn't have gone through all that to preach the gospel if he didn't believe in the resurrection. And I think I've skipped a couple of things, but anyway. If there's only one life for the believer, then where's the gain from the Christian, Christian walk? Why not live as the heathens do? And then, um, God did not condone such behavior in the past. He doesn't condone that behavior now. And that kind of behave, belief or doubt can, can lead to um, lack of moral integrity, can lead to casual morality or even outright immorality, which God condemns. So Paul was, went to his closing argument in verse 33. He quoted a Greek proverb well known to his audience. Bad company ruins good morals. We see similar warnings like that in the scripture. So Paul was suspecting there were internal and as well as external influences in them that motivated the Corinthian believers' doubt. So his warning to the Corinthian believers was against doubts that rising from inside and outside of the church. And then in verse 34, he exhorts them to wake up. And the Greek word for wake up is basically to wake up from a stupor. And then, the, then he said to wake up as is right, and the Greek word for that is actually an adverb, which means that you should wake up properly and do not go on sinning. Because Paul looked at unbelief and casual morality as a, a drunken stupor. And he said, once, once you wake up, don't go back to sleep again. Don't go on sinning. And then he basically said that lacking knowledge of God is a shame to a believer. It makes sense for an atheist to deny the resurrection, but it makes no sense for a believer to deny the resurrection. 
And once a believer knows God, knowledge of God should be a defining characteristic of a believer. We know God's characteristics from reading his word, as well as from examining Christ's life and example. And as a part of last part of Paul's challenge to Corinthian believers doubt of the resurrection, he rebuked those Corinthian believers who chose not to believe and saying that that was their shame. So once Paul had presented his challenge to the resurrection doubters, then he was free to continue by answering some of the questions, which is where you're going to get to tonight and where Paul begins to open the curtain a little bit to show us a little bit of what the Holy Spirit had revealed to him about what we have in store for the future. Before we get into that, let's have a some moment of silent prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to gather to study your word and to look at some of the answers that Paul brought to the Corinthian believers to answer their doubts. I pray that you would forgive us when we doubt you, because when we doubt you, that's one way of going astray. I pray that the Holy Spirit will, be, will speak through me and will speak to, to me and to everyone else in the congregation so that we may gain a deeper understanding of your word and of this mystery that Paul revealed by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to us. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 38. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. Continuing verses 39 to 41. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is, <clears throat> there is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for a star differs from stars. So a star differs from stars in glory. Paul, as a teacher, Paul held no illusions that he had answered all of their doubts and he had convinced them. As a teacher, all teachers start out as students and teachers never stop being students. So he knew both sides of the teaching conversation. As a result of his experience being a teacher and a student, he could anticipate some of their questions. So we don't know whether these questions that were raised, that he read them in an epistle, or if he heard about them from someone who had passed through Corinth, or if he had just anticipated what questions they would ask. But it's like, <clears throat> excuse me again. It is likely that these questions came from the same doubts that arise from Greek dualism, which held that while the soul is good, the body is corrupt. And the first question, how, has to do with uh, doubts of, of the possibility of, of God's power. And he, Answered those, he's answered both questions in the reverse order, so he answered the question how in verses 50 to 57. Second question, what form, which comes from the doubts of that would come from our lack of imagination. We think that God is limited just like we are. And he answered those question, that question in verses 36 through 49. Verses 36 through 38, he used a planting analogy. And he used an example that would be familiar to most of them, even if they weren't farmers. 
And Jesus uh, used a similar analogy to explain the resurrection as well as to speak about fruit um, bearing in John 12, verses 23 through 26, which we'll get to later. And then in verse 39, Paul cites a difference in form between different bodies to help to explain God's sovereignty and giving each body a different form as he chooses. And then lastly, in verses 40 through 41, which we won't get to tonight, the difference between earthly and heavenly bodies. But it's all, it's, all of this is Paul's way of explaining that God in his wisdom and his sovereignty gives each being the body that, they, that fits what, the, what they're supposed to have. So we'll start off in verse 35. But someone will ask, how were the dead raised? Or, and with what kind of body do they come? So Greek dualism, death was a release of the, of the soul from the corrupt body. And it might be that some Corinthian believers doubted that God would uh, perfect those bodies and they, they shuddered the thought of having to be raised into bodies that were just as mortal and, and clanky as the ones that they had right now. So we don't know whether they doubted that God would or God could do that. But Paul wanted to confront that right away. They may have believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, knowing, believing that his virgin birth, that when he was born, his body was perfect and not corrupt like the rest of ours are, so that when he did rose from the dead, he was perfect. God didn't have to perfect his body because it was already perfect. And so again, they doubted that maybe God would, would perfect their bodies. And there are at least three possible sources of doubt. Some could be new believers who are weak in the faith and weren't ready for the meat of the word. And it could be some believers still followed the Epicurean philosophy of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die, and that's something he'd already confronted. And it could be that some weren't actually believers at all, were just pretending. And because they didn't actually believe, there was no reason for them to have faith in the resurrection. And they were probably trying to convince other people to join them in their doubts. The first question, how the dead are raised, doubts the possibility. Second question, in what kind of body will they come, but it represents a failure to understand or imagine. We get a hint of Paul's answer from his old man, new man analogy in Romans 6, verses 5 through 11. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would, whoops, thought I got rid of those. Okay, brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin. Once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The two questions bring, raise two different objections. First question, how did that raise doubts the possibility? And the second question is the failure to understand. No, I just went through that. And then both, both types of doubt limit our faith. And God's power is not limited, as we read in Matthew 19.26. But Jesus looked at them and said, 
With man, this, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And in classic Greek thought, the resurrection was impossible. And so most of the believers in Corinth came from a Greek background, so that if being, being Greek, they would think of that. After all, after corruption has done its work, what's left of the body? If the body is not cremated, or buried at sea, once the flesh has rotted away, all the, only the bones are left. And then the, those bones are, well, the, in the Jews at least, those bones were collecting into bone boxes with bones of, of other family members. And eventually, the, even the bones would become to dust. So over time, the physical material from these bodies that have died would be all over the environment. So some people doubted that God would be able to put all this back together. Well, God's not limited by any of that. God has the power to do whatever he needs to do to accomplish his objectives. So in Greek thinking, that would make this impossible for God to raise the dead. And if God would construct a brand new body out of new materials, that would be creation and not resurrection. The transmigration of the soul into a new body. And that's not what scripture teaches. And then... What kind of body do they come? The Greek noun for a body, somati, means organism. If the resurrection body, so that means that the soul must reside in some sort of body. If, in, if the resurrection body is the, the same type as the deceased body, then what is the purpose of the resurrection? Humans can sin in the natural body. Is that possible in the new body? And then in, in the Greek adjective, sark, or flesh, is a type of body. And that's the type of body we have now. That may or may not be the type of body we have in the resurrection. The natural body requires food and can procreate. The body to come is said not to require food and not to be able to procreate, as Jesus revealed at one time. Then how is this the same body? And the Greek verb to come is in the passive voice, which means that the body does not come by itself. God is the one that brings the body. And then, and so what, of what sort of uh, composition is this new body going to be? Because right now the bodies we have, uh, one of the most common causes of death is either blood loss or interruption of the blood flow. But and God has revealed and re, God has reserved the use of blood for remission of sins to shed. And that's why Jesus died on the cross for us. But when Jesus described his own body, resurrection body to the people, he called it a body of flesh and bone. So it may be that our new bodies will not require blood. But we won't know. This also means that Jesus met them in a material body. So whether it was body of flesh or not, he said it was flesh and bone, but it was, it was different from ours, but yet it was material. And then Paul referred to the asker of the question as a foolish person. And that's, uh, he, his statement was a serious one. The Greek word for foolish refers to a lack of sense. Paul's use of a leading pronoun intensified his statement, you fool, you foolish person. It is likely that he knew who this person was or who these people were, but he declined to identify them. Now, Paul's use of the terminology did not run afoul of Jesus' uh, prohibition against calling someone a fool because Paul didn't say it in anger or in malice. Paul said it in a way of trying to correct their thinking and, and answer their doubts. And we see that Jesus condemned calling some a fool in anger in Matthew 5, verses 21 through 22. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother 
will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. That Paul's use of this charge referred back to his rebuke from 34. Verse 34, he rebuked the Corinthian doubters who lacked proper knowledge of God, calling this a shameful condition. So basically, this foolish person was foolish because they lacked knowledge of God. And one of the most common Hebrew words for fool in the Old Testament referred to those who lacked moral character. And this was verse 34. He says, Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. In, in Psalm 14, 1, you read, The fool says in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. And in the New Testament, God confronted the foolishness of human wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 19 through 20, and then verse 26. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning. I will, th I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is, the one, where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? And then verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. So Paul used an analogy from nature commonly familiar to his audience to combat the foolishness of, of the objections to the resurrection. Thus, Paul began his first answer to the second question, how? And then he said that death is a prerequisite for resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 36, B. While Jesus often used examples from nature in his parables, Paul's approach differed in that he usually stressed human involvement in the processes that God set up. So thus Paul began his analogy with the planting of a seed. Paul reminded them that in nature, death always preceded life. When we plant a seed, we bury it in the ground as if it is dead. Still, the seed, by dying, overcomes its environment. The seed becomes corrupt, rotting away to provide nutrients to the plant embryo. The seed germinates, producing a new plant. The Greek for come to life is passive, meaning that the seed itself does not bring about the expected change. An outside force is required to bring new life out of the seed. We know that God provides the growth, while a naturalist might ascribe this to Mother Nature or to life, we know that life is not a force of its own, but a process under the control of the sovereignty of God. When Dr. Malcolm in the movie Jurassic Park spoke of life overcoming obstacles, what he should have recognized had it been a real story was that God, in judgment against the foolishness of the genetic engineers, had caused some of the female dinosaurs to switch sex so that they could reproduce, and thus confounding the geneticists who thought that they had a really cool way of controlling the population. Thus the dead do not rise to life without God's actions. In the face of the regular occurrences of the natural world, why should someone doubt God's power to raise the dead back to life? Such a denial would be the essence of foolishness and lack of knowledge of God and his power. By explaining that death is necessary for resurrection, Paul turned the doubter's argument on its head. Such a no. Rather than preventing the quickening, death actually prepares the way for it. Only someone ignorant of the basic biology or farming techniques would scoff at the farmer planting seeds in the ground and expecting plant growth. By extension, only someone ignorant 
of God's power and nature would scoff at the idea that he would raise the dead. There is continuity. Each siege contains the materials and instructions for building a new plant. The two bodies are not the same. This is, and for, we read that in verse 37. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. When we plant a seed, we don't, do not plant the body that will be. When we plant the seed, we do not expect another seed to rise out of the ground. The germ in the seed carries the identity of the adult plant to produce a new plant of the same order. We plant a naked seed. The plant which grows from the seed is not naked, but is clothed with stems, leaves, flowers, eventually fruits and other or seed clusters. While the future plant does not exist, we know what pattern it will take. Jesus spoke of how beautifully God clothed the lilies of the field, Matthew 6, verses 28 through 30, and Luke 12, verses 27 through 28. And why, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you of you of little faith? Matthew 6, verses 28 through 30. And Luke 12, verses 27 through 28. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is live in, and in the field today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And as Job observed... We leave this life naked. It's as we came into this life. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And whatever we plant, what will grow will match what we plant. When we plant a kernel of wheat, a wheat plant will grow, not rye, corn, or some other grain. A kernel of wheat is quite different from the adult plant, but both are wheat. The body we have now is quite different from the one we will have in eternity. But both bodies will belong to us by God's grace. The current body is ours now, but not in eternity because the body will be replaced by the new body God will give. Death of the body is not loss of identity or continuity, but merely a stage in the process of resurrection. Each seed will produce the plants of the same type that of that which produced it. It does not matter what kind of seed you plant, God will make its growth consistent according to the type of plant from which it came. God shapes the new plant into the appropriate form. We do not bury the adult plant, rather we bury the seeds from the plant. The adult plant will die and not come back to life, while its seeds will produce plants. The butterfly comes from the pupa in its cocoon, not from a dead butterfly. And as followers of Christ, we will have bodies like his, while the resurrection body will maintain continuation from the moral body, there will be key differences between the two. God will transform our lowly bodies into bodies like his own, Romans 6, verse 5, and Philippians 3, verses 20 through 21. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his, Romans 6, verse 5. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. 
So basically, it's our citizenship in heaven, which we hold now, which will guarantee that we will have resurrection bodies. And moving into verse 38, clause A. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. God's sovereignty determines the new body's form. He chooses the form for each body. God, Paul's answer did not reveal the specifics of the resurrection body, but Paul's answer did confirm that God has the power to create a new body which corresponds to the old one. Each new body will co correspond to the old body. Each organism reproduces according to its kind. God gave each life form a form of its own at creation, Genesis 1, verses 11 through 12, after its kind. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit, in which is their seed, each according to its own kind. And God saw that it was good. So here again, another example, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, we throw that out, the rest of the Bible might throw that out too. We're not gonna do that. Just as we do not know how the new plant grows from its seed, we do not know how God will create the new body from the old one. If the new body is built from scratch and not from the old one, this is creation, not resurrection. So instead, each believer will receive his or her own body, but it will be a transformed body based on the old one, but built as God chooses. Thus, there is continuity in the identity of the body, but the new body is expressed in an eternal state. I should, should have said enunciate, eternal state, where the original expression of the body was in a mortal state, as it is now. In some matter which God has not explained to us, our resurrection bodies will be individually tailored to match each believer. Now we're going to go into a deliberate digression. Paul used the seed planting analogy to explain the resurrection, but there's another lesson that we can learn from it. Jesus used this analogy to ex explain the resurrection, but he also mentioned fruit bearing in his explanation, John 12, verses 23 through 26, as well as dedication. And Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So this is another aspect of of dying, the seed dying in the ground symbolizes our death to sin and our, our death to this world. And it symbolizes our dedication to follow Christ. Let me get some water. And we can apply this analogy to the beginning of the Christian life. Just as the seed rots in the ground, we are all born with a dead spirit, and our lives without Christ are dismal and rotten. The Holy Spirit revives the dead spirit of a new believer, just as God causes the embryonic plant to begin to grow. And just as the cells in the embryo respond to the instructions in the DNA in relation to their position in the organism, so does the Holy Spirit orient the new believer. The cells at w in one end develop into a root system, while the cells at the opposite end develop into a stalk, which eventually reaches the surface, producing leaves, flower, and eventually fruits of the appropriate type. 
Just so the Holy Spirit orients a new believer in an upright attitude so that spiritual growth may occur properly. The new believer needs to be rooted in the Word of God, both the written Word of God and, and the living Word of God, the examples of, provided by Christ. The Holy Spirit causes the new believer to reach upward to God the Father for light and to grow towards Him and to produce spiritual fruit, as a Brother Morgan has been teaching us. Galatians 5, verses 20 through 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And moving on to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 39. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. So Paul begins to deliver his second answer in verses 39 through 41. We cannot be certain of the form of the resurrection body. From the mortal bodies we, as we have now and the body that Jesus had before his resurrection, we only have an account of the resurrection body as clues to what our resurrection bodies will be. Take a tulip bulb as an example. If one had never seen a tulip before, one would never, if, if, would never infer that such beautiful flowers could grow from such an ugly bulb. The adult plant is always more beautiful than the seed from which it grows. Similarly, the butterfly is much more beautiful than the caterpillar from which it develops. There is diversity in the types of earthly bodies. Just as there was a wide variety in the plant kingdom, such is the case in the animal kingdom. The wide variety of life in the plant kingdom supports the wide variety of life in the animal kingdom. Besides this, the organisms in the animal kingdom depend upon those in the plant kingdom. And the Apostle Peter observed that all flesh is just as mortal as grass, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower fails. Some biblical scholars read that this verse, that in not all types of flesh are equal rather than the same. And I think we're going to stop here and then pick this up in October. Don't want to take too much time. But don't get your hopes up. I'm not taking a break from the summer. We're going to be doing a three-part character sketch on Joab. Because someone from the congregation rightly can, can observed that one session was not sufficient to cover Joab's life. So let's uh, close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to study your word and to confront some of the doubts that the resurrection believers had and some doubts that some believers still have. Thank you for your provisions for us. Thank you for caring for us and for keeping your promises that you will raise us up with bodies that were fit for eternity, where we will worship you and fellowship with you for eternity. Now please dismiss us with your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen.